If you build it, they will come. Lots of people uh, taking the detour towards the unexpected cosmology as of late. Probably has something to do with the mud flood. Fight it all you want, but the Millennial Kingdom will be the talk of the town, uh, certainly amongst the cool kids this coming year. So welcome, bonjour, and shalom. May my little corner of the internet be your home. I took my sons to the zoo a couple of weeks ago, and I noticed something. Endangered animals are almost entirely unclean animals. Ever see an endangered lamb or goat? I think not. There's a point to this, and I'm willing to bet endangered animals wasn't a thing in the Millennial Kingdom. Why? Because people ate clean, or perhaps they were vegetarian. Eat lamb for Passover? As Rob would say, they would have been feastitarians then. Leave it to uh, the post-mud flood inheritors to eat every animal in sight. Obeying Torah, it matters. All right, here we go. Do you guys see a picture just pop up there? Yes, no? There it is. What you're looking at is the oldest home in South Carolina, according to the official narrative. This home was built in 1678, I believe. So, a hundred years older than our country. And fun fact, I happen to be neighbors with this house. Now, the owners of this house, according to what I've been able to gather, opposed the country twice. Again, according to the official narrative. In the War for Independence, they were loyalists to the crown. They were not patriots. The, the, the owner of the house was a loyalist, and his son, being a young, uh, ambitious uh, teenager or man, ran off, I think, with the uh, company of Nathaniel Green, who was uh, a patriot. And after fighting the revolution, he came back to this house to find that his father had packed up and returned to England. And then again, in the Second War for Independence, as some of the Southerners called it here, they were, of course, Confederates. And uh, both times they lost the war. But here's the problem. I live in the city of Charleston, South Carolina. Again, I'm neighboring to this house. And the history of South Carolina doesn't line up with the mud flood account, as you will see tonight. Or contrarily, the mud flood shows that history is a lie. The revolution technically started in Charleston, South Carolina, at least for South Carolina, it started in Charleston. And I will show you the very steps where they said the revolution started. And that couldn't have been because that would have been pre mud flood. And, those, and I'm of the opinion that those staircases where they said it started wasn't there. What I'm saying is they're making all this up. I have looked through the history books particularly here for Charleston, and I see nowhere on record that my city was buried in 12 to 20 feet of mud. So it makes you wonder. Let's drop in another picture here. There's going to be a lot of pictures tonight, and hopefully this will be... Um, uh, all right, so there's an aerial view of the same house. Again, beautiful home, 1678. My house, by the way, is in this picture. I will not tell you where. But we are right on the water, so that gives a little bit of a hint. But we do border the uh, property line. You can see the house here in the southern uh, part of the picture, and the, the lawn goes all the way down to the water. And back in the day, everything in this picture was part of this plantation. In fact, the uh, Goose Creek Reservoir down there was a rice field. And if you know anything about how they grew, I always thought before moving to South Carolina, they all grew cotton here. I was surprised to find out that hardly anybody grew cotton in South Carolina. They actually came here uh, to grow rice. Uh, we have what's called the golden rice here. It's spectacularly good rice, but it would have been in a natural uh, river marsh down there. And, you know, that the, the rice pickers, the slaves would have gone down there uh, to pick it. Speaking of which... Um, well, I'll show you in a second. But what I want you to think about is if this house, I don't know how old this house is. I don't know if it was built at the beginning of the Millennial Kingdom or at the end of it. I do believe it predated the mud flood. And so the, the question I ask is what sort of person lived in this house? Was it a resurrected saint? We don't really know. 
So this is the inside. I'll give you a little real estate tour here because this is fun. There's the inside of the house, a very quaint little uh, adorable house. You can find that online. And um, here is the row of beautiful oaks leading up to it. It's not gonna. It's not gonna come up now, is it? Let me try that again. Do you guys see it? Is that coming up? It's not coming up, is it? No. Can you change it to a JPEG? Maybe that's why. Uh, okay. Well, that's okay. Not all of these are going to work. Here's a. Um, let's look at some old photo photos here before we delve into the city of Charleston. Here is an old photo of the house. Oh man, it's a it's a J fifth, a J fifth file. Bummer. All right, let's try another one. Okay, it's not going to. Okay, here we go. Here's a old picture right here on the Goose Creek Reservoir of what could very well be Mrs. Hadley and I going on a lovely. Uh, afternoon canoe trip, which we've never taken a canoe out there, but we go out there on our boat all the time. That looks like our neck of the woods. And here is a photo. I hope this works because I love, absolutely love this photo. It is a JPEG. And these are, um, they tell us this is the uh, 1930s. I don't buy it. Uh, it could be the 1930s, but if you pay attention here, if you look back there at those white houses in the background, those are slave cabins, and um, those are no longer standing here. I do. I have looked to see where those slave cabins are. I would actually feel really honored if they're right here on my house where I live, um, because I tell people all the time that I literally live on a slave plantation, both figuratively and literally. And you, you see a couple of children having a good time on the slave plantation. And um, here, good. It's another JPEG. This is actually turn of the century and this is the slave houses here and they look like nice houses um you know history um doesn't actually always isn't kind or fair to the housing that they lived in and i actually met a basket weaver here a very old woman she was nearly 100 years old and she learned the art of basket weaving weaving from her great grandmother who was a slave here in charleston so Let's see what else we can find here. Let's just go through some photos. Hey, Noel. Yeah. While you're doing it, I want to let you know the two files that you dropped that didn't work. I converted them and dropped them in there so you can look at them above. Oh, very cool. Okay. Thank you. So let's see where Rob dropped those in. Oh, yeah. So right here, the first one Rob dropped in, that's the tree line streets of beautiful um, oak trees. That is the street to my house. If you want to drive to my house, many of you in this room have. You have driven past that row of oaks. Now it's a suburban neighborhood, but those oak trees, uh, actually the roots come down underneath and form a tunnel and they become one organism. It's really cool. And the other one he dropped in here, we see the uh, the house. And one thing to pay attention to in all the old photos of these houses, they all look very old. In fact, the photos of the house now, it looks newer than in these photos. But here's some dude sitting out there. I was trying to find the really awesome photo of a bunch of Confederate soldiers standing in front of this house. I wasn't able to do it. And uh, And then I dropped in here uh, the last one of this house, unfortunately, is no longer standing, but it could be right where my house is. I don't know. But it's just really, I would live in that house. It looks like a very lovely cabin in the woods. The uh, This is called the Otranso Plantation. It was originally known as Yeshu or Yeshui. I'm not sure which, but that actually means green water. It was a Native American term. The man who came over and purchased the land in 1679 was named Arthur Middleton. So if you've ever been to Charleston, you would know that you might know that there's a place called Middleton Plantation. And this guy, Middleton, was super rich. He was buying up a lot of land everywhere. All right. So now let's delve into the actual city of Charleston. I've got tons of photos to go through tonight, and this should be really good. Is I'm not sure if Dave's in the room right now. I don't know if he showed up. Oh, there he is. There's Dave. All right, Dave, we're going to go through your photos first. So if you ever want to chime in and tell me what's going on. So <clears throat> one year ago, I had a Sabbath group uh, here at my house, and many of the people in this room right now were here for it. And the day after, so many people, they stayed the night at my house. We had a good gathering of people. Rob and Michael, I think you guys were here that weekend, but then you you didn't stay. You had to head home. The next day, we decided to go down to Charleston on a mud flood field trip. Now, this was a really interesting field trip because it was the spring of 2021. 
And the lockdowns had been going on all through 2020, as everyone will recall. I had not been down to this downtown Charleston since that time. Uh, Sarah and I used to go down all the time for a nice brisk morning walk. We used to love to walk through the streets. But then they started mandating that you had to wear a mask. And if you didn't wear a mask, they were going to fine you. So we're like, well, forget it. We're not going down there. Now, uh, Dave and others who were in the party with me can attest to the fact that we were threatened with tickets for not wearing masks. Every, you know, a lot of people wearing masks. My whole party would refuse to mask up. It might have been Super Bowl Sunday. And um, I was I was feeling bad if like, you know, it would be like a hundred dollar ticket for everyone. And, you know, but uh, luckily we never got ticketed. So I didn't really know what to expect. And this is um, OK, that's not St. Michael's, but this is the first place we pulled up. We pulled down there and I, I didn't know what to look for. And and Dave, uh, Dave parks with me. He goes and points over there. And what do you guys see? Immediately, we can see that there is a <laughs> like the third of a door. And this was the shocking thing um, in the city of Charleston that they didn't even cover it up, guys. Like they just like bricked over doors and windows and all sorts of stuff. And we've been walking past this our whole lives and never asking any questions because we just accept the reality that we're given and we figure they must have known what they were doing. And history never speaks about this, but that was the first thing we saw that. It appears that there is about a good 10 feet that is buried below this building. You can see where the original door was, the original street level, and they just built up. All right, let's find another one. Dave took these pictures, so here's another right here. This is awesome right here. Look at this. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> you can see an arch right there. This is like right when we park too. And I'm telling them like, guys, I don't know what we're going to find today. But here we find uh, that they, this was an archway right here. And you could see a window down there that they made into like a grate. And there's an archway right there. They just bricked right over it. That's, that was an old doorway. So again, the street is buried about uh, 10 feet down. Probably at this point, uh, there were points we counted anywhere from 12, 12 to 15 feet. I suspect some areas may be closer to 20 feet. Um, but anyways, that's not in the history books. And, oh, got to show this here. Here's, uh, this is a show and tell. So there's there's myself. I had just was growing my beard back in, and there's my wife, and there's Dave. So now you guys know what we look like. Um, I will be showing more pictures of this right here. This is us. This That's the back of my head. Thank you, Dave, for getting the back of my head there. Uh, we're walking down the battery, and these houses are, they were untouched during the Civil War. No cannonballs, nothing. I mean, I'm actually walking long, right along the battery at the ocean where the Union would have been coming in on their ships. And these houses are absolutely spectacular. They are beautiful to behold. They're gigantic. Gigantic. Uh, these are truly mansions. And um, one thing that Dave pointed out as we're walking along here, he looked up and uh, they had railing up on top. And he's like, hey, that's that's Torah right there. Now, some of these, they could have taken the railings off. But originally, you can see that these all had railings along the tops of them. And so I am continuing uh, to build my theory that Charleston, before the mud flood, for the most part, was a Torah observant city. At least it leaned that way by its building codes. Um, here's another house here where you can see that um, it goes deeper down. And there's like a screen door they put there now. And, you know, I don't know. I guess that leads to the basement now. But that would have been ground floor at one time. Also, what's really interesting here is that if you look at this photo, you'll see there's a door there that leads to a, an open uh, walkway, like a breezeway. Well, this is this has my interest because this is a Charleston pastime. It's a very standard type of house to have a door there with an open walkway. And the the reason I'm told that everyone says is that the ancient residents of Charleston would leave that front door open. And if that door was open, you were free to come in and uh, commune with them and, you know, in a brotherly fashion and have your mint julep or whatever, whatever they served you. But if the door was closed, that is a sign that they were indecent and that you were not to come in. Um, so 
back in the day, you know, nowadays the idea of walking up to someone's home is like, you know, they're going to call the cops on you, but that's not how Charleston was originally constructed. It's kind of interesting to think about. Well, it really started to hit the fan. Uh, I think Zach is in the room with us tonight. He was the one to point this out. And this just blew our socks off. This is a, a brick building. We actually stopped here to use the bathroom. If, if it wasn't for, I think it was my children that needed a bathroom break. And if it wasn't for that bathroom break, we never would have seen this. If you look closely at this, so this is a brick building that is used now by the National Park Service or the city park, whatever. But if you look there, that's a gate hinge. Do you guys see that? Look past the ferns there on that, uh, that, uh, that door frame there. That is a gate hinge. They left the hinge on it. And it's on both sides, by the way. They didn't even bother to take it off. That was unbelievable. When we saw that, we're just like, dude, this has become a serious reality. Like the city of Charleston was buried. And right around the corner from this, you're going to find um, this right here. So that they just put a wood walkway over the arch. Look how deep that goes down. That has to be... Um, I'm going to say 15 feet right there that it goes down 12 at the least 12 to 15 feet that goes down. And they just, they just put a walkway right over it. Hope no one would notice. And for the most part, it's working now at this point in our, in our journey, uh, Zach, he's like, all right, I'm, I'm going to start digging. Like if I get a shovel out, he goes across the street. Those are, those are my, uh, those are my children there. Um, that, I think that's my wife standing there. So again, you see another door here just hanging right there. Like who in the world builds a one foot door? Like nobody does that. And they will tell you, oh, well, you know, that's like, that's a crawl space. Oh, really? Well, you see that grate there? He went, <laughs> we started going up and down the street and Zach was one and doing it. He's just pulling up the grates and we could see that there were doorways going down about 12 to 15 feet. And they're just right there, truth in plain sight. Nobody, everyone's just walking right past us. Nobody's even looking, which is how we spend our entire lives, right? That's what we did. Let's see what else we can find here. Here's another one. Uh, you can see, I mean, this one's really deep at this point. You see that arch just barely hanging in there. Here is another photo where you can see the door, and they just cemented over it. In fact... At, at some point in history, they built a staircase going down to the front entrance. Now, who in the world would build a building where the front door, you have to go down below sea level or the, 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 the sea wall to actually, to actually get down there? Like, nobody would do that. And, you know, so eventually they just gave up and they even cemented over the staircase. These here are a little bit hard to see, but you can see... Um, you can't really get the depth perception here, but this was again in plain sight. You, with these grates, we were taking pictures through the grates and showing um, down there. Here's another one where I think Zach opened up the um, there. You can see a staircase leading straight down, and it's dark down there. But if you actually look, you can see the doorways. There's doorways in basements just leading to nowhere. All right, and. Here's a picture of me and uh, Zach and Courtney, and we are looking down here at the original level. So again, I, I assume about 15 feet down. And here's the last one from Dave's role I think I'm going to show. That's a really cool one there. I like that. So again, you could see, I mean, guys, that's clearly not a crawl space. Like, there's no way. Like, you could totally see that that was a doorway, and they just Originally, like with the mud flat head, they're like, okay, we're, we'll build a staircase down there and eventually just put a grate over it. And um, let's see what this picture is here. I'm kind of interested in this. I, I want to talk a little, little bit more about St. Philip's. I'll talk about it later. That steeple you see there is St. Philip's, and it's actually leaning. It's, it's similar to the Leaning Tower of Pisa and some of the other Leaning Towers you see around the world. And they say it's because the foundation is soft the right there. soft right there. Somebody. I don't know who, okay, I'm getting feedback. Okay. I don't buy that anymore, that it is, uh, it's a soft foundation. I think that was a mud flood event. And we see this all over the world where when the mud flood happens, it, it literally liquefied this, the soil and you would have had all sorts of tall buildings that leaned over. So that's not the best picture there, but it, it is leaning. All right, let's move on. 
Hey, I was going to say too, there, there weren't any pictures, I guess, but I remember seeing uh, windows under street level too, like full windows through several of the grates, um, which was kind of odd. And yeah, we uh, were, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say that it's just weird. Like I, I live in new England, you know, it's farmland We're at ground level, but walking through Charleston, the entire thing feels like you're on a boardwalk, whether you're on the street, the sidewalk, literally on the boardwalks that they built up. Like it's just, it feels like you're up high in the air. It's extremely odd. And I never, but see, the thing is, though, is that that's looking at from woken eyes. I I have been to Charleston. I started coming here in 2010. I I fell in love with it immediately, and and I never I never had that perception until now. And we we hear all the time about how how beautiful the South was before the Civil War. And, you know, Sherman went through and burned everything. Now we know why. We know why they were going through. They were targeting Tartari- what we would call Tartarian cities, but I would say Millennial Kingdom cities and burning them down. And there's some oddities here we're going to be talking about tonight. Much of, much of Charleston was burned down in two ways. One, there was a big fire during the Civil War, which conveniently burned down like a third of the city. And then the Union came down and kicked down a lot of other doors and destroyed things. But we still have quite a few buildings. And from what we have, it was a beautiful city. I mean, we like I'm really getting this understanding of what what the South, you know, when they talk about the beauty of the South. And they tell you that it was built by slave labor. Ha. That's just not buying that anymore. All right. So now I'm going through Zach and Courtney. Th- thank you, Courtney, for sending me your photos. We'll see what we find here. Um, a lot of them are going to be the same. So here's another one. It looks like a grate, but you can clearly see that was uh, a door. Actually, actually a window. I take that back because here is another angle. And actually, yeah, I actually showed the same photo, but from a different angle in Dave's. Let's see. Here it comes. Boom, there it is. So again, you can see the door there on the left that was bricked over and what appears to be a window. Here's another archway. I don't think I showed this photo. These must be larger photos because they're taking longer to load. That's uh, uh, that's pretty insane right there. I mean, that looks pretty big. Um, you probably could pull, you know, you could pull a horse and a cart through that thing. All right, here is a lovely building that... It's kind of interesting because it looks like two buildings stacked on top of each other. And we couldn't really make that out. But if you look there, look at the railing on top. Again, you got railing on top. That's, that's tour observance. Um, beautiful building. This you know predates the Civil War. It wasn't destroyed. It looks like maybe they did a lot of custom work on the bottom. I'm a little con- confused about that one there. Um, you know, Does it go deeper? Not really sure. I'll go ahead and show this here. This isn't really mud flood proof, but this is what we call the slave market here. And in the 1800s, this is where the, you know, a lot of the, the slaves did the shopping for, for, uh, for master. And this is the market they would come to. This is where all the slaves would congregate. And, you know, it wasn't like in the movies where they're like, they can't leave the plantation and they're all like in shackles. Like they just freely walked around guys. Like this city had more black people in it than white people. And, um, and this is where they can now, Fun fact, I am told that the, the buzzards here in the 1800s, and this, this, is, this is more testimony to the Millennial Kingdom again, that I don't think that, that there were as many people eating food back then, and we've been over this before, but in the 1800s, they had to kind of come up with uh, modern irrigation and, and systems that maybe weren't always there in place. So they came up with a system because for city trash collectors, they brought in buzzards and vultures, and they were actually protected by law. You were not to touch these vultures and buzzards because they came in and ate the rotting meat that people would just throw on the street. And uh, these buzzards and vultures would get so large and fat that they couldn't even fly anymore. Um, And they would cover this here. All right, let's see if they have... Oh, this is fun. There's a little... um, Freemason building we came across, and what do you know? It has the phoenix on it, the double-headed eagle. 
And there it is. On this site stood the building in which the Supreme Council, 33 de uh, degree, which keep in mind, Charleston is on the 33 parallel. Uh, Mother Council of the World, ancient and accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, was founded May 31st, 1801 AD, corresponding to uh, 7, 9, uh, 19, 5, 5, 6, 1. Um, Solomon's Lodge, number one, ancient Freemasons, chartered by the Grand Lodge of England, 1735, was organized on this site October 28, 8, 1736. All right, let's see what else we got here. Can I ask a question about that? Yeah, feel free. Um, a while ago, we were talking about like uh, the Odes of Solomon book in it. It kind of seemed like the onset of the end of the millennial kingdom was slow. Do you see like Freemasonic organizations like this? Like, do you think those dates make sense with your timeline or is that, is that fabricated? Well, those are good questions. Uh, I do believe that we can, we can glean much from official history. Um, like, you know, for example, in Orwellian terms, you know, uh, the Dark Ages would be the Light Ages, right? The Age of Enlightenment would be the Age of Self-Enlightenment, right? The Satanic Age. And so I do believe that the Enlightenment was uh, an age of rebellion where you had the technologies of the, the Millennial Kingdom, but now is being corrupted by people who did not love the Most High, they did not love his son Yahusha, and they were... Uh, you know, just corrupting art, corrupting music, corrupting all sorts of stuff. You had uh, secret societies becoming more prevalent, you know, taking control. You write the banking systems. All sorts of things were coming to fruition at that time. So it's really it's really hard to say, though, on dates, right? I mean, we, we've been over this. We, we really don't know. I don't put much trust in these dates. But there, there is something to say be said, I think, about the 1700s. And uh, a lot of, you know, rebellion going down in there. So, all right, let's see what else we got here. I had a question about that, um, that date there, the 5561. If we were looking at, um, I think it was Book of Adam and Eve and some other ones that talked about year 5500 when Christ came. Yeah. Then would, yeah. That, would that just be 61 years after? If so, how does that equal 1801? I have the... I've gone over those dates before, and I can't remember for the life of me right now, but, but what they add up to, you have to add to those dates. They're not actually straightforward, but I would, um, I, I really, like I said, I don't necessarily trust those dates, and I don't think that they're putting um, actual real dates out in front of us. I just think it's all just corrupted. Well, I, I, was, I was actually wondering, what if the 5561 was correct, but it was the 1801 that wasn't correct? So it actually was 60 years after Christ. I, I, possibly. Yeah, I guess that's a possibility. I mean, I, I don't think that's the case, but it could be. It could be. I, I don't think that... I, yeah, I don't know. I, don't I was going to say, it's, it's known that um, the quote-unquote Jewish accounting of their years is also off by about 250-ish something years. They, they um, subtracted or took away. Um, I'm, I'd have to get the documentation for that but yeah the five five the year date that they give for now is not correct so this is a really interesting photo right here uh, the one i just dropped in and you see the white pillars going up two stories and again the you see what looks like a doorway right there and they just they plowed a staircase right over it and went up the sides. These staircases also have my interest because here in Charleston and what i'm trying to figure out are these staircases, uh, by tradition, pre or post mud flood? The here in Charleston, historically, if you were a woman, you would enter one staircase, and if you were a man, you would enter on the other. And you know, nowadays, you know, post feminism, whatever LGBTQ plus, you know, all the different things today, rainbow. Uh, they would just, you know, have a heart attack at hearing that. There were a lot of courtesy reasons for that. One is that they didn't want the men to follow up the staircases behind the women and lust after their ankles. That's what we're told. 
according to the official narrative. And uh, and so women would have their own staircases where they could freely go up and down, and men would have another. It's kind of like you know the same concept of having um, a bathroom today for men and a bathroom for women. They would have their own staircases and their own hallways to walk down where they could feel, especially on a really hot day, because it gets sweltering heat here in the south. And you know, a woman may just want to uh, you know lift her dress up a little bit and get a little air up there, and not have to feel like a you know peeping tom is watching her. So. Anyways, we see a lot of staircases like that, but what's interesting about this staircase is it looks like it just was plowed over a uh, pre-existing door. That's why I bring that up. All right. Can you you all hear me? Yes. Cool. Yeah, I I successfully uh, extracted my old headset. (laughs) Go ahead. Oh, it's... uh, I I was going to mention something earlier, but that was in the section before, so I'll just wait until the end. Okay. All right, I haven't looked at some of these photos. I'm not sure what Zach and Courtney captured here. It was probably something really awesome. I'm not seeing it. But I think we made it through those. So let's go. Um, here they have, um, let's see, what what is this show right here? Here we see another staircase going down. They took a lot more of the, by the way, we started noticing a lot of other doors with gate hinges on. In fact, this photo right here might have one. Let me look a little closer. Mm, Yeah, I think you could see where they took them off. This one may have taken them off. We started noticing a lot with actually gate hinges still on them, or you could see where they took them off. I mean, it's... Guys, it was so lazy. Like, when they... When this mud flood happened, they they did a lot of work into custom designing these buildings, kind of change them around a little bit. But some things they were just really lazy with and just kind of plowed over, as I've already shown you. All right, before we return to downtown Charleston, we're going to take a break. And we're going to go over to a favorite plantation of mine. This is called Boone Hall. And this is from a movie called North and South. It had Patrick Swayze in it. You can see Patrick Swayze over there on the right. It came out in 1985. It was based on a trilogy of books by John Jakes, which I used to love the series back in the 80s. I watched this time and time again. Now I couldn't even stomach it because of the propaganda, and they're just the straight-out lies. I mean, pure propaganda. But um, this right here in the background is called Boone Hall Plantation. It is a beautiful home. I have taken tours of it. You go in, it looks very old. It feels very old. But that's not what official history tells us. I'll get to that in a moment. Right here, we see the beautiful row of oak trees leading up to the house. You can see the house way down there. Um, If you were standing on the street, this is such a big plantation, you could not see the house, which is a little bit important to this narrative. When you get a little closer to it, here are the gates that lead up to the house again it's drop dead gorgeous um here's another photo all right it's settled it's a beautiful house now let's look at some aerial photos so here's the house from behind you can see the garden some really nice symmetry in the garden and i am under the impression that the garden would have been a lot more beautiful, almost very European looking back in the day. I do not believe that is a recent addition. I think that's very old. And I think that it's actually very uh, uh, pales in comparison to what it once was. Uh, So here you can see from the other angle, and you can see that it's right there on the water, just like our house. Uh, You know, a lot of people, there was a reason in in Charleston that they would want to be on the water. It's because they live by the water and they would take boats everywhere. And I, that doesn't, you know, that plays a lot into the uh, mud flood, pre mud flood narrative. This one more aerial photo I want to show it before we get into the, the disappearing trick, the sleight of hand. As you can see here, again, you see Boone Hall right there in the middle, dead center parking lot over there on the right where tourists come. That if you were to take a tour, you would park there for a tour of the grounds. But there on the left, Towards the kind of the bottom, you could see three of them. Those are the um, uh, slave um, homes. And they don't look nearly as nice as the slave homes here at my own uh, plantation. Those are built of brick. And they, they actually leave them up, I think, for indoctrination purposes. They make it look like people lived in these terrible dirt floors. And I... I don't know if I, I mean, yes, there were some, you know, a-holes out there who were terrible slave owners, I'm sure. 
but I do not think that was common practice. I actually think they had pretty nice homes for the most part. All right, now this is where it starts getting really weird. Let's read a little bit about, about this. They tell us that this photo right here is the original Boone Hall. This house right here, this little rinky-dink shack. Here's what Wikipedia tells us. Canadian Thomas Stone purchased Boone Hall Plantation in 1935 from the Horobeck Estate, coinciding with the Colonial Revival Architectural Era. Okay, make a mental note of that. Deciding that the surviving wooden house did not fit their idea of a southern plantation house, Stone and his wife, Alexandra, demolished the historic structure. They replaced it with a historically styled yet modern house in 1936. All right. So here is the construction photo we were given of Boone Hall. Now, maybe this was built in 1935. Maybe it wasn't. I really don't know. I could show you picture after picture after picture of plantation homes that were destroyed in the Civil War, uh, were run down, and they were fixed up again. To me, this looks like a house being remodeled. And in fact, they tell you, if you look at uh, the chimneys and the other areas, some of those bricks look really old. Well, they tell you in the official narrative, the house of Boone Hall Plantation is modern, built during the first half of the 20th century. We got that. Um, a architect named William Harmon Beers was, uh, was hired to design a larger modern residence in the colonial revival style. Again, make a mental note of that. Um, let's see. It's, it was built on... Okay. Let's see. Oh, uh, it was built using incorporating materials from the plantation's old farm structures, as well as salvaged historic brick recovered from the Laurel Hill brickyard. So what they're telling us is they, they built this brand new house using old bricks. All right. So um, that, that raises my suspicion. Now, keep in mind, I've taken, before the mud flood, I've taken tours of this house multiple times, and they would tell me that it was built in 1935. I'd go like, you're kidding me. This was built in 1935, and that's what they keep saying. So remember now, when North and South was filled there in 1985, it was actually filmed in 1984, the house would have only been 50 years old at the time they built it. So I went down the rabbit trail of the, um, the colonial revival style. And I found out that the colonial revival style comes from the Centennial International Exhibition of 1876. I did not know that. So this house, they tell us, Boone Hall, was inspired by the architecture of the Centennial International Exposition, Exposition of 1876. Now, if you remember a few weeks ago, we went over the Chicago World Fair of 1892. Well, the Centennial International Ex Exhibition was the one that kickstarted all the World Fairs. It was held in Philadelphia from May 10th to November 10th, 1876, to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence in Philadelphia. Um, and I'll show you an overview. Uh, overview. This is a drawing of what it looked like. It looked marvelous. And then we come across buildings like this. Oh, boy. That looked beautiful. And, of course, as you would suspect, they tore it down. They built, they built these beautiful buildings for this first World Fair. And afterwards, they tore it down. And the World Fair inspired all sorts of architecture around America. Why am I not surprised? So I'll leave this up to you. You guys can decide whether they built this house in 1935 or whether it pre-existed. If you go back up and look at that photo of the original house, that could have been built anywhere on the property. Um, this, this entire plantation, I should have mentioned, is where they filmed Roots, the 80s uh, TV series Roots, as well as North and South, parts one and two. And they have houses like this all over uh, the plantation. For all I know, that could have been the foreman's house. I don't really know. Um, but that's what they tell us was originally there. I, I kind of feel like that's one of the uh, strange sleight of hands um, in this whole mud flood narrative. Now we're going to go over to this house here. Now I don't I don't uh, suspect much foul play here. This is Drayton Hall. 
I just thought I'd pass this by you. Beautiful house, very old. Not as old as the house I neighbor, but this one is very old, about the same time. It's a, a gigantic house. And if you look at the insides of it, it is stunningly beautiful inside. Once again, you see the double staircase. You see one going up on the left, one on the right. So that shows that it does predate the mud flood. And this custom of apparently women and men going up one and the other side uh, may hold true. There's one of the rooms. I mean, this looks like you're when you walk through there, it looks like you're in Europe, like you're in France. It is. It looks like a French house. It is is stunningly beautiful. And one last photo of Drayton Hall before we move on. This is after the Civil War. You could see how this thing was almost blown to hell. I mean, um, I am very suspicious of the that doorway down there and the staircases going up. Makes me wonder if that was maybe it was originally, but I don't really know. It's not exactly buried. But look at the windows are gone. The the centerpiece, the decorative piece on top is missing. Doors are missing. And so you can clearly see that someone had to come in and do total restoration on this house. And it doesn't look so dissimilar from the construction photos we saw of Boone Hall. It looks very similar. Uh, so that's kind of my thought on that, that someone may have gone in and just replaced what was already there. All right, moving on, we're going to go to Fort Sumner. Now, as always with the American Civil War, we are shown photos, I mean, I'm sorry, illustrations of battles. We are never shown photos. There is never one photo of a battle ever shown in the American Civil War that should raise all of our suspicions as to what was really going on. On April 12th, 1861, there was a lot of boom, boom, boom going on in Charleston Harbor. And guess what, guys? Nobody died. Nobody. Look at all those fireworks going off. Nobody died. This well-known fact has often bothered me. They could have at least faked the number of deaths, as they so often do. Nobody would question a hundred casualties with names like Jedediah Smith or Henry Jones, even if they were invented. The only mortal injury happened afterwards during a hundred gun salute, a certain Private Daniel Hugh. It is not an accident by any means that Fort Sumter resides on the northern 33rd parallel. The Civil War began with the lowering of the American flag at Fort Sumter on April 14, 1861, by Freemason Robert Anderson. It ended four years later when Anderson raised the American flag over Fort Sumter on April 14, 1865. If you're paying attention, that was the same date, April 14 and April 14. And guess what? Abraham Lincoln was shot at Ford's Theater by John Wilkes Booth that very night, April 14. What a, what, <laughs> how convenient. The Civil War was like one big flamboyant Freemason convention. So, so before I talk a little bit more about Fort Sumter, since we're on the assassination uh, hoax of Abraham Lincoln, we see right here, this is a picture of Antietam, and we see Mr. Alan Pinkerton there on the left, the one and only Pinkerton, uh, with Major General John A. Mc McLernand. And if you look very closely at those three clowns right there, the two of them have their hands in their sleeve pocket. Well, isn't that strange? So here's another photo. And what's funny about this is that they actually positioned this same photo two times. And they actually uh, rotated Lincoln here on this. Uh, he may have been tied to this post. We're not really sure. But he, they rotated Lincoln, and they still kept their hands in their pockets. Like they were really trying hard to uh, pass a message here. So I thought, since we're on the subject, I would read up a little bit on Pinkerton's history. Let's see what we read here. I'll drop this in for you guys. Western Police Agency, which later became Pinkerton and Company, and finally Pinkerton National Detective Agency, still in existence today as Pinkerton Consulting and Investigations, a subsidiary of Securities AB. Um, what I wanted to say here was, okay, Pinkerton's agency solved a series of train robberies during the 1850s. So keep in mind here, they, they got their start with trains and solving train robberies, all right? First bringing Pinkerton into contact with who? George McClellan. 
the chief engineer and vice president of the Illinois Central Railroad. All right. So George McClellan, the head of the Union Army, who then, who later uh, unsuccessfully ran against Abraham Lincoln for president. But who else did he meet? Abraham Lincoln, the company's lawyer. Now, I, I knew, I had no clue that Abraham Lincoln started out. I knew he was a lawyer, but I had no idea he was a lawyer for the trains. All right. And the, and the <laughs> like, you see all these people coming to prominence in the 1800s who were making a lot of money off those railroads. And isn't that something? Um, so they're all connected to the railroads. They're all buddies from a long ways back. Let's see what else we could read here from the Wikipedia. In 1859, he, Pinkerton, I highlighted this, attended the secret meetings held by John Brown and Frederick Douglass in Chicago, along with abolitionists John Jones and Henry O. Wagner. At those meetings, Jones, Wagner, and Pinkerton helped purchase clothes and supplies for Brown. Um, and they. <laughs> okay, so we we read that okay he held secret meetings with John Brown and Frederick Douglass in Chicago. In my paper on the Chicago World Fair, I already told you that Douglass was a spook. He was an intel agent, but now you can clearly see that John Brown was too. It was an intel operation, and the raid on Harper's Ferry, by the way, was a hoax. All right, so we saw the sleeves in the pockets. Well, who else was putting their sleeves in the pocket? Oh my goodness. Say it ain't so. No, not this guy, too. <laughs> uh, John Wilkes Booth, he was in the uh, hand and the sleeve uh, club right there with Napoleon and, and uh, probably Stalin and all those dudes. How, how interesting. He must have been on Pinkerton's payroll. All right, getting back to – see, I went on a little uh, rabbit trail there. Let's get back to – Fort Sum uh, Sumter. So here you can see a picture of Charleston Harbor. Over there in the black, that is Charleston, the city of Charleston. You can see the city grid. Right there, smack center, it looks like a, like a crumb on a map, is Fort Sumter right in the middle. And if you look a little bit to the south, because we're going to get to that next, is Fort Wagner. The Confederacy fired on... Fort Sumter. Oh, yeah, I didn't read this. Let's see. Did, did I still have this in here? Let me see if I have this in here. Hmm. Oh, yeah, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. But I want you to look at these photos here. As always, it looks very old. And what do we read? Fort Sumter is a sea fort built on an artificial island protecting Charleston, South Carolina from naval invasion. Its origin dates to the War of 1812. So here they are, they're, they're taking us back to when it all started, mud flood era. They're saying that because of the British, because the British invaded Washington by the sea, they figured they needed to build all these star forts everywhere. That's the official story. Of course, when you look at all these star forts, and I'm going to be giving a presentation on the star forts of Florida, because I visited all of them. Every single star fort, I believe, in Florida I have visited. And it's ridiculous the narrative they give. They're way older than they, they say. And even though I get it, like, it took a beating. Yeah, it took some cannon fire. By the way, nobody died. That's, that, uh, that fort, it looks pretty old. Let's see what else we can read here. Named after George Thomas Sumter, a Revolutionary War hero, Fort Sumter was built after the 1814 burning of Washington during the War of 1812. So they're going with the burning of Washington story, which again, I believe is a hoax. I don't believe that the White House really burned down. I think the White House is original. I think they just, you know, had to give a story for its building. But this is where it gets really interesting. Let's look at these photos here. That is Fort Sumter during the Civil War. Do you see something wrong with that photo? It's covered in dirt. Okay, let's find another photo here of it. Here's another one. Why would they cover it in dirt? You can clearly see that Fort Sumter was not designed as a military fort. That should be like the giveaway here. The Confederates inhabiting the fort knew it. They had to pile dirt up around it so as to cushion the impact of cannon fire. So what I'm saying here is that, like all these star forts, if the military was building these to stop naval invasions, and, and these ships are coming in with cannon fire, they didn't do a very good job. Because as soon as it took actual cannon fire, 
they're like, oh, we uh, that's not going to work, that design. It's getting pulverized. We need to put dirt around it to cushion the impact of cannons. That should tell you, time and again when we look at these, that they were not built for military use. All the military did is they come in and they trashed it. The military has a reputation. Whenever they go in and move into places, they trash it. Even when you go to places here in the South, and like you see wherever Sherman and his boys showed up, the officers club, uh, it was they would always trash it. That's just what they did. Again, another photo here of Fort Sumter covered in dirt. This is during the Civil War. Um, I like this photo here because now we see a close-up of Fort Sumter. And you look at the ornamentation there on top of the building. Do you really think that a military fort, that they would put ornamentation like that on a military fort. I don't think so. Like when you see the military build buildings, they're very basic. And yeah, that's not that all what we're seeing. And when I show my star fort presentation, I will show you evidence that all the military did is they come, came in and deconstructed it. They took off the decor. They, uh, they stripped it of its beauty and made it look military but here you can see some of the original ornamentation, which lines up with many of the buildings we see all over Europe. I imagine that if the military wasn't there, that would have been a beautiful building to behold. Oh, so I told you to make take a mental note of Fort Wagner. And now we're going to see an actual fort built by the military. This is Fort Wagner. Uh, that doesn't look like a star fort. It, what it looks like is well i'll get back to it well maybe i'll do it now let's see let's pull up um some photos here once again um if you watch the movie glory it came out i think in 1990 it had matthew broderick it was of the 54th massachusetts and their glorious charge up to fort wagner in which most of them were killed once again we see an illustration of the battle. We don't actually see anything other than that. This particular illustration is called Storming Fort Wagner, and it wouldn't be made until 1890, nearly 30 years after the fact. And here we can see the 54th Massachusetts, an all-black regiment as portrayed in the movie Glory. What else can we find for Fort Wagner? I wanted to show you what an actual military fort looks like, which is not at all like Fort Sumter. There you go. As you can see, Fort Wagner sits in stark contrast to Fort Sumter. They literally just dug into the sand and then drove stakes into the ground. It's a glorified sand castle. Didn't we read that Fort Wagner was built as a joint project with Sumter? It was actually in the Wikipedia notes that I must have skipped over it, but that's what it said. It was built with Fort Sumter. How was one glorified with brick and this one so sloppily constructed that it eventually washed away? It's, it's no longer there. It doesn't even exist anymore. Um, here's another Civil War era photo of Fort Wagner. And then here we see it then and today. You can go visit it today. Not a stone remains. Not a fence. Nothing. It is just beach. That is what the military built uh, to fight a war, the brutality of war. All they did is destroy Fort Sumter. Speaking of which, one of these weeks I'm going to do a presentation on baseball. This man right here is a man named Abner Doubleday. Now, spook literature only grudgingly identifies baseball's inventor as this man. Abner Doubleday. He was born in 1819, died 1893. For whatever reason, they attempt to spin the narrative, and it appears as though the bones of Doubleday, buried today at the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York, the very location of baseball's invention in 1839, are caught up in an identity crisis. The baseball crisis may or may not have something to do with the fact that Doubleday was a theosophist, this guy right here. In 1878, Doubleday relocated to Minham Township, New Jersey, just 40 miles due west of New York City. His move apparently had something to do with the fact that Helena Blavatsky and Henry Still um, Olcott, founders of Theosophy, moved to India that very year. 
So this guy, Doubleday, was very close with Helena Blavatsky. Doubleday became the president of American theosophy in the wake of their absence. The Theosophy's founders, of course, were spooks. Hopefully you guys know that by now. And Doubleday was no exception. Was he also a Freemason? We are not told. But Doubleday did fight at the Battle of Gettysburg, and that was one big flamboyant Masonic Summer Festival. The Wikipedia describes his greatest accomplishment, wink, wink, by highlighting the fact that Doubleday aimed, oh, pay attention to this, Doubleday aimed the cannon that fired the first return shot in answer to the Confederate bombardment of Fort Sumter on April of 1861. April 14th, I believe it was. Major Robert Anderson, who would be knighted in New York City the following year, was Sumter's defender, and he was a Freemason. Then again, PGT Beauregard, who fired upon Sumter, was a highly ranked Freemason, having only recently been knighted. So the, the guy who fired on Fort Sumter and the guy who defended Fort Sumter were both highly uh, ranked Freemasons, and they were knighted. So there's that. All right, let's see what else we got here. Let's keep doing our tour of Charleston. Hopefully you guys are enjoying this tonight. This is the picture that started me off on my, my quest. I used to love this photo. This is an amazingly beautiful photo of Charleston in the aftermath of the Civil War. And as you can see, Charleston is pulverized. But there's a problem with this photo. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. If you look closely, you can actually see the, the uh, St. Michael's back there, the uh, steeple, which we'll get to in a minute. And there is a building in the foreground that is under construction. If you look at the rafters there, the sky is darker there than the rest of the sky. And that's a big giveaway. Somebody took a great effort to take scissors to this photo and cut, cut out the skyline. Why would they do that? There's photos all throughout the Civil War that are given to us that somebody took scissors to the skyline and cut it out. So there was all sorts of things in the skies in the 1800s that they don't want us to know about. Now, on closer inspection, if you zoom into this photo, you can see that it, there's some very good cutting work. But you can see some uh, areas where they got a little sloppy. The big giveaway is actually in the rafters there. Now, in modern renditions of this photo, which I just added here, they try really hard to cover it up. They lighten the sky, uh, but you can still see in the rafters there, it's still darker. darker. <clears throat> Here's what I was talking about earlier. This is um, St. Philip's, and as you can see, it is leaning a little bit. It's kind of leaning forward. I believe that's the uh, effect of the mud flood. This is, a, of course, a Civil War era photo right here. Uh, this is a picture that Zach and Courtney took. Uh, no, they didn't take this photo. Um, this is actually now the Confederate Museum. But here's another really old photo. Um, kind of looking for ab abnormalities in here. Uh, some more photos of Charleston. Let's see if we can find anything in here. Oh, yeah, I want to talk about that house in a little bit. Here we can see, okay, so this is the, that's the rafter shot right there. That's from a different angle. But here you can see the sky is from this angle. Nobody appears to have cut it out. All right, so this is where it gets kind of interesting. Here we have St. Michael's. Beautiful building. If you look just to the south of St. Michael's, you see this big uh, castle-like building. It's a Built of stone, beautiful building. If you look closely, it's clearly mud flood. There is a basement there. You can see the windows down there at street level. But this is, I believe, run today by the U.S. Postal Service. And uh, I find it really hard to believe that the government, the U.S. Postal Service, would build a beautiful building like this. As always, you know, these are just repurposed buildings. Now, if you look at St. Michael's, the steeple there, who in the world would build a steeple? Um, with that much detail, uh, that beautiful. It's you. You could see it's hollow up on top. They put a bill in there now. That's not originally what they put in there. They uh, it was a um, probably a type of uh, like a tokamak. Which, if you guys don't know what that is, that's a device that uses a powerful magnetic field to confine plasma. 
uh, create and produce controlled thermal nuclear fusion power. I know that's a little trippy, but uh, that's what I believe these churches, these cathedrals all across the realm uh, were doing. They were harnessing power. If you look at this closely, you can actually see that they they buttoned up the, the windows. These were all openings. They didn't know what to do with them. And so they just put shades over them and they removed devices. They left the opening on top, but you can clearly see that this was used to get energy from the ether. They did not build this elaborate bell tower. I, I mean, I, I used to believe that. I used to think that they put all this money into these elaborate bell towers, and that's ridiculous. Here's St. Philip's, uh, again, another angle, and beautiful, but look what they did. They buttoned it up again. They closed the holes on it. Why would they do that? And um, just a beautiful, beautiful building. So speaking of... Oh, before I get to that, let's just show one more here. Here's, uh, I think that's St. Michael's again. You can see how beautiful this town. I mean, it's a stunningly beautiful town. And you, you could probably triple the beauty before the Civil War, this Millennial Kingdom city. So this right here is what you would call a bandstand. <laughs> now, you notice this octagonal shape. Let me see. One, two, three, four, five. Six. Yeah, it's oct uh, octagonal shape, as bandstands all across our realm are. And I've also, you will also notice that baptismals and cathedrals all across the realm are oct um, uh, octagonal shape. Now, that will be for a different presentation, but I do believe that these are also. Uh, these were used uh, at one point in time to harness machines. You would put machines in the middle of this. And I didn't believe that at first until I started seeing some of the photographic evidence in the 1800s of people removing uh, hardware from these octagonal shapes in church steeples, towers, and, of course, bandstands. And um, they were, this is, you know, repurposed for music playing. What's interesting about this park is. This park is, they tell us, is a lot of pirates are buried in it. So that they would, uh, pirates were always coming into Charleston. It was a famous port. They would hang them and, uh, and bury them underneath. So it's actually a graveyard for pirates, so they say. Also, Blackbeard came here. And because he held Charleston ransom, uh, he was hunted down and killed on a beach in North Carolina in the Outer Banks, which I've also been to. All right, so speaking of bandstand, so this is one bandstand. It's a nice looking bandstand, but then we have this beautiful bad boy right here. I have never seen this bandstand in person. It looks enormous. I don't know if it's still there. Um, I can't tell you at the moment. I started looking for it. I couldn't find it. They tell us that this bandstand comes from the did you know that chicago had an exposition as well around 1900 they tell us that this bandstand came from it well let's see if we can find it and there it is now they took it apart and they redid it but i believe that is the same bandstand and yeah, look at that beauty and look how it's connected to that building over there once again it's it adds to my theory that these were types of batteries that were used to um power and give electricity to people. And uh, here's another building from this so-called World Fair in Charleston. That's a beauty right there. Beautiful building. And they told it, they tell us they built that for the fair. And then of course, what do you know? They destroyed it immediately afterwards. I didn't even know Charleston had a uh, exposition until I was looking into it this week. That just slipped right by me all these years. A few last observations. This is a, I guess, a historic uh, diagram of what Charleston looked like before the Civil War, or so they tell us. Again, it's a sketch, guys. I get it. Propaganda may not be legit. You do see a few more towers in the skyline here, a few more um, churches that I don't believe are there anymore. You do see St. Philip's and St. Michael's over there. But what I hinted at earlier that I really wanted to talk about was the battery right here. This is uh, stamped 1865. Again, you see the same beautiful homes that we that you saw the back of my head walking along, going all the way down the street. Now, what's interesting about the battery is that this wall is here to keep the ocean out, and that makes no sense whatsoever to me. Uh, yeah, Bob, you're asking where are the people? That's that is interesting. There is no people in the streets, and when you generally you see a lot of these Civil War 
photos uh, post Civil War, the streets are pretty abandoned. You'll see like you know one or two people posed out there for the camera, uh, but they're pretty empty, aren't they? And I I don't know what's going on. Anyways, my point is is that they had to build this wall to keep the city from flooding. Now, why would you do that? Why would you build an entire city at a place? Where if the wall came down, the city goes bye-bye. There's only one other city in America that I can think of that does this, and that's New Orleans. New Orleans has the wall, which if the wall, if the you know, if the uh, wall goes, so does the city. We saw that with the Lower Ninth Ward back in was it 2014, 2015, and um, and I don't know. I've I I don't know what to make of that. I have uh, speculated that even though the water, the ocean level has not risen. In the last 100, 150 years since measurements have been taken, thereby disproving the whole global warming agenda. I do wonder if maybe the water, the ocean level was a little bit lower at one time before the uh, mud flood. Just a thought. I think I've gone through all of my pictures tonight. I can't believe that. I went through all of them. So I think that's the end of my presentation on this. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Do you guys have any questions or comments on anything that we went over? Yeah, I was thinking if a lot of if a lot of earth fell into the water, you know, mountains fell, things like that, that would displace water and raise water levels. I was just thinking that last thing you said. I agree. Yeah, um, clearly the uh, yeah. What do you, James? What are what's the what are you getting at there? Oh, there's no shadow there, huh? I got a, I got a thought. Uh, when you're talking about the, the Charleston uh, World Fair or, or fair, I just wonder how many other cities in in just the U.S. or the world during this time period had a quote World Fair type of event, and then suddenly they all wiped out some buildings because I this is I, I've come across several of them that stated this. So I wonder if there's a even more if anyone has collected or have done any research on that. Yeah, I would like to go through more of them, but you have San Francisco, uh, you have St. Louis, and what's interesting is that with all these, most of these, I can't say all, but most of these world fairs, like we had with Chicago, they uh, there was a big fire or a destruction event that happened beforehand. With the San Francisco World Fair, you had the was it the 1906. Uh, earthquake that destroyed the city with uh chicago yeah. you had the chicago fire that was started you know famously by mrs o'leary's cow which of course that's a hoax of course um and the, <laughs> uh i think chicago officially acquitted the cow like 20 years ago which is just a joke it's like lol but anyway, so that followed that event. So here in Charleston, it follows the destruction of Charleston. Um, you can just, you can go to, oh, St. Louis uh, World Fair. That followed a uh, a mud flood event, a huge flood. And they talk about it. Like there was a huge flood that swept through, killed a lot of people. And then they put on the World Fair. And this has caused me and a lot of other people to question the narrative at all, total and be like, well, what if all the dates are wonk, you know, wacky, like just all, you know, out of whack? Like, what if they don't line up right? What if, you know, there there was actually a number of resets in the 1800s or, you know, and we kind of have history books telling us this happened on this date and that date. And this is why I, I say that even if you could prove that the mud flood happened in, say, 1812 or 1800 or 1805 or whatever, that doesn't mean that it was, you know, do the math, 200 and uh nine or ten years ago it just means that i don't know i mean there could all the dates could be mis messed up in the 1800s so hopefully that i don't know i don't know what to make of it all oh yeah let me show this one more picture here i totally forgot this this is the building right here ah it didn't go up that they tell us that the American Revolution was started on when the uh governors and uh the people who ran ran the governorship of Charleston stood on these steps and they declared that they were breaking away from the queen or the king, uh, King George the third. And uh, those steps right there. And I'm a little skeptical about that. I'm a little skeptical that those steps were there. 
This is another mud flood building. It actually goes much lower. And actually, you can take a tour of the underground of, <laughs> of this building. Of all the buildings, you could take a tour of this building, and they tell you it was a dungeon. Now, maybe it really was repurposed into a dungeon in the 1800s, but I don't buy that. So you have to actually go a little ways down there, down into the dungeon. Yeah, you could see. Yeah, you could see that. I mean, clearly it went further down. So what I'm saying is those steps that they so-called uh, America was born on <laughs> uh, did not exist. That's just I could be wrong about that. But something yeah. else that um, a lot of these buildings that we saw had in common was lion head door knockers and i didn't get a picture of any of them um but they were really interesting to me and i did a little research on it and the official narrative on that is that they're a uh, georgian architecture that they originated in britain um but i find that odd that that would be the case if these lion head door knockers are all over these buildings that are very, very old. Yeah. Yeah, we were we were just finding, I mean, uh, um, Courtney, we walked around for maybe two hours tops, and we didn't even see, like, we saw a small little section of the city, and there were so many things that just were not lining up. Like, our eyes were woken, and we were just going like, nope, 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 that doesn't, like, nothing was lining up. Things that I would never look twice at back in the past. Right, yeah, I would have never noticed it either. But it was truly fascinating to see it with your own eyes. You know, it's it's different when you look at all these pictures on the internet, but seeing it for yourself, it really just solidifies it in your mind like something happened here. Yeah. Um... Here's a here's a nearby plantation home to where I live. And it's kind of interesting. You could see that it's kind of built on something there. So I decided to look underneath and see what I could find. And you get this. This is, um, you know, they tell us that's the basement. But I feel like that had other uses. And we've seen this same uh, arch design all across the realm with mud flood buildings and they were used for you know uh storage of water or other things that i don't necessarily believe uh what they're telling us that it was just built as a basement once again here's a this isn't really mud flood too much but you can see here this is a classic charleston home door that opens up right here to this whole wing and we have uh, house after house, like just hundreds of homes like this. And, oh, that one's not going to go up. It's not a JPEG. Here's another one. And it's just house after house like this. And so I just think that's cool. Just that there was a, you know, humanity was very different. And people would open up their doors and say, come on in and just go hang out on my porch. I would love that. I would love if, like, you know, I could just open up my door to you guys. And you guys could, I could wake up in the morning. You guys could be hanging out there. and. I could just sit down and talk, you know, bring out some mint julep. It's like, it's like Abraham, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yep. So, uh, the, the first, uh, Grand Lodge of Freemasonry started in like 1717. Is there any weird things in history from right around that time that would, um, I don't know, link up to any of this? Well, that's during the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was, you know, going up to the American Revolution. And so it's what I've said over and over again that that when we're looking at the the you know I did that thing on uh, Michelangelo the Divine and the House of Medici and showing how the Medici family was actually starting the banks and taking over governments they were being kicked out of cities everywhere uh, being expelled because of what they were doing but they were actually funding the renaissance and a lot of the artwork and music and other things like that and so i believe that in the last 100 to 200 years or so i can't really give dates but you know like the last general bit of it that there was a general rebellion that started 
and you could see the breakdown even post mud flood where you just see like the breakdown of movies, the breakdown of music, the breakdown of artwork and how, you know, you it actually changes society. Give you an example. A uh, hundred years ago, most people, they got married straight out of school. They got married when they were 16, 17, 18, very young. And uh, they stayed married until they died. And they would have kids and, you know, maybe the wife would have... Uh, shoot out eight to nine, ten kids. Maybe she would die in childbirth. Maybe he would get a second wife and have several more kids. But, or ch- I'm excuse me, children. But, um, you know, couples stay together. And then what started happening? We start seeing the corruption of music in a number of different ways. You see the Freemasons start jazz music in the uh, 1920s. You see before that ragtime, which is coming out of of classical music, the ragtime and the jazz combined to make rock and roll, blues, all sorts of stuff. But when you get into like the 1940s and 1950s with the Bobby Soxers and then Elvis Presley uh, and country music, you have all these breakup songs. It's always about my baby left me and this just breakup song after breakup song after breakup song. And pretty soon you start seeing people break up left and right. You start seeing teenagers, they break up. You see couples, they break up. You see married couples, they start divorcing. And you can see a total connection between the music and how it's actually leading people's lifestyles. They listen to these these songs and they do what it says. It just manifests in their lives. And so in the same way, you can see this corruption building up in the Millennial Kingdom at the end of it. Um, and I did that whole, some of you were here for it, or you may have caught the video. I recommend everybody listen to it. It's called. Uh, wastelands of the seraphim uh, millennial kingdom plus mud flood and the wastelands of the seraphim in which i go through scripture showing all the um all the different scriptural verses where it says do not go out basically to babylon to the wastelands uh that's where the dragons live that's where the fallen angels live the seraphim that's what the dragons are the seraph and uh that the reptilian so and so forth and they would be out there schooling you in the mystery religion so what happens if you tell people not to go somewhere, not to do something. They're going to do it. They'll be like, what What do you mean? You're telling me that I can't go out there. So they go out there, they learn, and they come back and they start um, uh, bringing that into society. Well, if you're a magistrate uh, expected to hold up Torah, what if you don't do anything about it? What if you let it slide? And you're like, well, maybe they'll be on good behavior. Maybe um, we'll just be tolerant. You know, and then one person, one generation's tolerance is the next acceptance, right? That's the way it works. And so you could see the breakdown until finally, I believe that there was a total rebellion. Um, I think the enemy kind of started rising up in anticipation of Satan's release. And uh, you start seeing a lot of occult symbolism come out in the open. You see it, you know, on buildings and artwork and that kind of stuff. They start blending uh, occult, um, you know, like the mysteries, uh, Greek mythology in with Christian uh, uh, illustrations, like an artwork and stuff like you'll see, you know, Bacchus and uh, like, in a, you know, and the rape of Europa and, you know, all that kind of stuff and Venus. And you start seeing that come into play. And so I think that's how it happened. That was kind of a long explanation. But yeah, I think that there was a rebellion and it brings, you know, the revolution in 1776 to new light. That was the year that the Illuminati were formed, according to official history. It was the year that, um, you know, apparently the United States declared its independence against Great Britain. But what we have seen with the uh, the the uh, the testament, I think it was called the Testament of Enoch. It was a video I made on the rise or return of Rome, the uh, the beast. Is that the 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 two headed phoenix that we see coming out of the flames, according to the prophecy in that book, was. Um, appears to be England and America, interestingly enough. And of course, England and America are both run by Rome. Uh, that would be the body, right? But um, so, yeah, I think that, it, I even think that war, because, you know, we're still, we're still officially, we're run by the crown. Like the whole idea, we run, we won our independence from Britain. That's, that's, that's a lie. We never, that was the greatest hustle in history. You know, Britain's like, they're, they're sailing off and they're like, Oh, you beat us. Oh, sorry. We're leaving. And you know, we're still run by the crown and who runs the crown? Rome does. Um, I think Rome runs everybody. I think they run, uh, you know, the Ashkenazi, they run, they run everybody. So. Well, if they didn't, we wouldn't be on a Roman calendar, right? That's true. Yep.
the only thing that I wanted to mention about earlier when you talking about planets is that um, I know some people don't think Mandela effect exists or anything, but supposedly planets was one of those words uh, that wasn't in the Bible to begin with, and now it is. So I don't know. Just well, what do you what do you think? Was, what do you think was there beforehand? I don't know. I don't know my scriptures well enough, but I, I'm sure somebody here would be able to say. Um, so, yeah, I don't know about that one. All I know is that it's supposedly a Mandela effect. Yeah. Now, I'm I'm a I'm a as you know a supporter of the Mandela effect. I believe it's legitimate. I have experienced it firsthand. Um, I do think. A great deal. Not all. I think there's a lot of Mandela effects, particularly in the King James Bible. Uh, but I think a great deal of the Mandela effects that are reported in the Bible um, are like someone like seriously like making videos who proclaims to be a Bible expert, and it's like I don't think that guy is a Bible expert. And then it starts spreading, and then everyone starts thinking that was a change, and and yeah. you know. Things like did that. you take? Did you happen to see the one that I posted about um, the Bible quiz? I didn't see that. Yeah, go check that one out. You know, take the quiz and see how you do on it. <laughs> Might be a something. Interesting. Um, I had the I had the Mandela effect happening to me a few days ago that uh, blew my mind to do with the Bible. So, um. I have a very vivid memory. I, I have um, actually a photographic memory. So everything that I read or I hear, I store it in my memory as a picture. So I definitely have a picture since childhood that when Moses um, and Aaron went to Pharaoh for the first time to ask him to um, let their people go, um, when they when they threw, when Aaron threw the staff, the staff turned into a snake. Um, and that's my memory since childhood, and I remember studying it again and again. And then a few days ago, I picked up the Hebrew Bible, <laughs> and I couldn't believe my eyes. That verse now says that the staff turned into an alligator. Wait, what? No, an no way. An alligator. I was so shocked. I couldn't get over it. So I, um, I talked with Rob. I asked him, what do you remember? I didn't tell him anything. Just asking, what is your memory? And he said, um, serpent. And I'm like, oh, maybe in English they translated it into a serpent. But in Hebrew, it's definitely a snake. It says nachash. So then I called my brother-in-law. He's an Orthodox Jew, and he, 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 reads, he, he read the Bible more than any other person that I know of. Okay, so I called him and I said, hey, um, don't open the Bible, just, <clears throat> just from your memory. Tell me what the stuff turned to. And he was so offended. He thought, I'm like, what kind of a stupid question is this? Of course, it turned into a snake. So I said, okay, go to your um, um, library, find the Bible, open it, and tell me what it says. So he opens the Bible. And seriously, I thought he was going to get a heart attack. <laughs> he, he, he couldn't believe it. And then for a few days now, he has been obsessed. He goes from synagogue to synagogue and picks up books and send me pictures of those pages. And in every page, it says alligator. <laughs> what, what, is the, uh, what is the Hebrew word? I know alligator, but what's the... Tanin. 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 It doesn't even sound the same. Nothing. Because yeah, I'm looking at Bible Hub right now for Exodus 7.12. Uh, and it says, well, it says in English serpents, but in Hebrew it says, li tan taninim. Yeah, which is not true. The original, I, I'm telling you, and I... It was nefesh. You, yeah, it used to say nachash. And then if you if you go down a few verses it still says nachash like he, he all of a sudden in the verse that it used to say nachash it said tanin and then 
go down like three verses and God was saying something and the stuff that turned into a nachash, into a snake. So it's like the Mandela effect worked on the beginning of the page, but not on the middle of the page. Like the same, just yeah. read that passage. Do you You're see right. it? Yeah, a few yeah. verses in, uh, yeah. se in 7.15, it says, uh, Nahas? Nahas, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. So... So obviously it turned into Nahash, not Tanin, and it has always been Nahash. I mean, all my life I remember it. So I don't know what happened, and my brother-in-law doesn't know anything about the Mandela effect, and I, I, I couldn't, I tried to explain it to him, and he just couldn't, he didn't understand what I'm talking about, so I let it go. But I... I'm still waiting for him. I asked him to go and dig and find a really old book, like from 40, 50 years ago. I want to see if he can find a really old book and tell me what, he sent me a picture of that page. This is one of the hard things about, what's sad about the Mandela effect is that, uh, now, do you, Okay, so you've been reading Hebrew for a while. When was the last time you read that passage in Hebrew? Um, many years ago, because okay. in the last few years, I've been only reading English. And only like in the past year, I'm starting to go back to, to Hebrew because I'm interested in comparing the translations. Well, this is one of the sad things about the Mandela effect because the Mandela effect, the Mandela effect is almost ten years old now. Where a lot of these changes were happening back in like uh, twenty fifteen in the whereabouts, and so people are now coming to the truth or coming into the Bible now years later, and you know they have no memory of passages like Lion and the Lamb, which I so clearly recall sitting down, reading, rehearsing, discussing with people, and now you try to talk to people about that, and they're like. They're, you know, they're having Bible studies now on the wolf and the lamb, right? And it's, so it's just like generation, however long we go through history, generations of people are just going to be accepting these, these changes. Exactly. Well, and, you know, I do want to mention this, that not everybody is affected by every Mandela effect. So you may be affected by that one, but me, I might know it as alligator. It's always been alligator. What are you talking about? So I just want to point that out. I, now I don't disagree with that, you because I do think it was serpent. So, but um, that, that's uh, by the way, that's true because my sister was on the speaker when I was talking with him, and I was trying to explain the Mandela effect, and I said, "Yeah, you know, for example, Nelson Mandela, you know, he died when he was in prison." And so my sister jumped and she said, "No, he didn't." You know, and then I realized, okay, she's on a different timeline. <laughs> so, yeah, and good. um, I just posted something in there today. Betty White's not dead, people. <laughs> she just turned a hundred. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'll tell you this: I remember her dying a few years back. So this is now the second time that she's died. And, you know, that, that kind of stuff is kind of, like, uh, pretty easy to play off because, you know, one could say, well, it's just media propaganda, right? But at the same time, everybody's spreading the news around. You know, it's on the news. Uh, then all of a sudden, oh, she's alive again? Okay, yeah, she just turned 100 today. Or yesterday or whatever. Noel, what do you think about the relationship between CERN and what they're doing and the Mandela effect? Well, I, you know, I don't know what to think. I mean, I, I obviously know that the first time I learned about the Mandela effect, you know, several years ago now, it was connected with CERN and the, uh, the Collider. And, you know, that's, that's as, you know, smashing atoms, that kind of stuff. They're, you know, declaring that they're going to when they light it back up again this year they're going to be taking was it physics to the uh beyond the next level or beyond the edge or whatever they're calling it which is a really scary thought uh, i don't know i don't know if if cern is connected with mandela effect i think it is 
but that's as much as I can tell you. See, the thing is with the Mandela effect is that when you talk to people uh, about this called conspiracies, there's two types of people, people who accept something without needing an explanation for why. And the people who need an explanation as to how and the why before they're going to accept it. And so most of the people who need a how and a why, they're like, if you can't explain to me how they're doing it, then I'm then this must be a trick. They must not it must not be happening. I don't know what was happening. I don't know what is happening to history or time or you know if this is a dimensional thing, a time issue, a, just a, a a sleight of hand, a parlor trick. I don't know what's happening. All I do know is that these uh, these things are changing. That's all I can tell you. I accept the fact that our perceived reality is changing on many different levels. Usually on the corporate level. Usually they're like corporate, you know, like uh, words and and logos and that kind of stuff, uh, which tells us that you know Satan has a total right to change his own um, artwork, his own properties. Uh, you know, when he's, when he's trudging on the Bible, that's a different story right there. Uh, yeah. but that's, that's all I can say. I, I know it happens. Um, and it is what it is. Again, I don't, I don't know if it's a time travel issue. I mean, someone just said maybe Satan's trying, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know if time travel is possible. I don't accept that. I don't believe that time is actually a thing. I don't think there is such a thing as time. I think time is just a clock. That's all it is. It's just the sun yeah. and the moon going around and around in circles up there. That's time. It's not well, a most thing. People, most people, you know, tend to think that time is, you know, a day and a night and a cycle and like a year, you know, but really it's linear. It's there is no past. There is no present. It is all the pre. I mean, there is no future. There's. It's all the, on the present. You know, it's all on the same timeline, so to speak. But, um, yeah, yeah. It, it is very odd. I will say. You know, and you know, you you can't you can't really tell somebody what it is uh, who doesn't know what it is. Um, and you know what what I just don't like is that. People that aren't affected by the Mandela effect in any way or haven't found one that they can relate to, that their memory serves them and, and you know, they can say, oh, well, I remember it this way and now it's this way and it always has been for all recorded history. Um, you know, what I don't appreciate is them blaming the people that are Mandela affected because they're not the ones that are doing this, you know, and to to say that we're led by Hasatan or something that that is total bull okay um it, it's kind of like the spoof in college humor that they did on uh with sinbad that never existed uh the shazam movie i remember watching it as a child and now it has never existed but college humor did a spoof on it and in that spoof they include all the different mandela effects okay um and then the the children in that spoof, they're in the garage, and they say they can take what they want from us, but they can't take our memories. Well, that's you know that's a key right there. You know they're they're just messing with us. So I don't know. They are they are they are they are messing with us. And so I actually do want to do because it seems like there's a lot of interest for this. And um, though my main focus is mud flood now. And the Millennial Kingdom, I, I do plan to put a paper together on the Mandela Effect because I think that if CERN is going to light it back up again this year, that's important. Yeah. And we're going to see some things. Now, I want to point out to everyone because people who are not believers in the Mandela Effect, they come, yeah, like you, like you said, like they come all the time and they're like, well, you just believe that because they, you know, they're just putting those thoughts in your head, whatever. You have bad memories. I remember it correctly. Well, here's the thing. Before I ever knew Mandela Effect was a thing, before I ever knew, I was noticing these changes and feeling very uncomfortable about them. And I didn't know what to do with them because I had no context. I'm like, uh, I don't remember that, but okay, I guess I have to accept this reality. Here's, a, here's an example. The, I remember when I, when I watched Back to the Future again. And the terrorist van at the very beginning that they shot Doc Brown because he stole the plutonium from him, it changed. 
uh, to like a VW bus or something like that. It didn't used to be. I remember what it used to look like. I remember watching that going, that's not right. Like what, what's going on with that? And it just made me uncomfortable. And I kind of turned off the movie. Like every single time I observe these, I would like turn it off. And so the lion and the lamb is something I would turn to Isaiah 11 um, over and over and over and over again and read it all through the 90s into the uh, the millennium. And I'd get in discussions with people about the lion and lamb and how that's the you know the millennial kingdom and all this kind of stuff. And and I remember the day I sat there, I opened my Bible, and it said wolf, and I got this really dark feeling and i'm like that's not right and i started uh flipping all over isaiah trying to find well maybe it's a different passage and i started looking online and it wasn't anywhere in the search engine i'm like i used to look this up and it was gone and i i kid you not i shut that passage and i did not open it up again for probably about uh probably seven years seven or eight years before i read from it again i didn't go back there until i learned about the mandela effect the other one was the Ford logo. I remember the moment. It was August 2nd, 2015. I didn't learn about the Mandela effect for another few months. And uh till early 2016. Uh, I was a little slow in that department, I guess. And uh I remember driving out past the California border into Arizona and I had just bought a new Ford truck about a week or two earlier. And I didn't really look at the logo, but I remember seeing a Ford in front of me and I looked at the logo with the pigtail that's there now. I'm like, huh, uh, Ford, they changed their logo. I, th- I just thought they rebranded. I had no context that if I were to do a Google search that all of my memories of what Ford looked like was gone. Um, and so those are just examples that I give that I, you know, I um, noticed. Um, no, I have like a, a huge example. There is a new documentary about the Mandela effect that just came out and it's on telegram and i try to upload it to discord but it wouldn't let me maybe it's too big uh but anyway the do you remember the guy um do you remember um the sweepstack thing the um, yeah the guy from nickelodeon the, uh, whatever the the this the the, the Rob, I talked with you about it. Can you remind me the name of that thing? Like it's like the one million dollar yeah, thing. Ed Ed McMahon of uh, yeah pub- yeah yes yes Publishers yes, Clearinghouse. Yes. Yeah. Now I remember. I mean, I moved. I I lived in the U.S. at the time, and I remember at the time I was watching TV, and it was like I was so irritated by it every time okay he goes to houses he brings <laughs> that stupid you know stupid check and all this and now they are saying that it never existed and he remembers it and he is amazed because he did it and now he is told that it never happened that, yeah. that's what they are saying how can how can they say that it never happened we watched it week after week after week and we got the we in the mail we would get all of those letters to join the sweepstakes do you, does anyone here remember this what i'm talking about yeah, uh, that this is a big one for a lot of people um and i don't know if you can even call this a mandela effect at this point it's almost like a you know erasing of history but um, I remember being like nine years old back in the early nineties and watching those commercials and um sitting at home imagining Ed Mick McMahon um walking up my driveway with a check. And I used to imagine <laughs> him coming up and knocking on my door and that I would get one of those checks with all that money. And so yeah, I have memories of that. And there's that episode of Johnny Carson where he gives them the check, you know? Yes. Uh, yeah. You oh know, uh, yeah, I remember that. And one you know, of the ways what one of the ways they screw with us, Intel is screwing with us, is something like ET Phone Home. Now, I watched ET when it came out, you know, which is a terrible film about the watchers and you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, astral projection, you know, cre- you know, the ethereal realm, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I watched it when it came out in 1982. It was one of I I have a video I have a tape cassette of me as a two year old. Walking around my house, going "ET phone home, phone home," because you know I yeah. love it a lot, and I would say it mm-hmm. over and over again. It was one of my, it was one of my first. Uh, my mom says it. It was like my first line I ever said, <laughs> and and so you know now he doesn't say "ET phone home." He sees uh, "ET home phone," 
And so people will say, well, that's bad. You know, just bad. Me-. Like, yeah, we all have bad memories from the 1980s of, you know, we all. But anyways, so what's really interesting, and this is what we call residue, but this is the residue is is perfectly it's targeted to to gaslight us and to screw with our heads. If you look at the uh, the 2002 re-release of E.T., which I also saw in theaters. Where Steven Spielberg did like more special effects on E.T., you know, give him a CG overhaul. Uh, the trailer to that film in the same scene, you can see it. He says E.T. phone home. But then in the actual movie release, he says E.T. home phone. And so right there, they did that on purpose just to screw with us. And they do it all the time. Yeah. And uh, I just want to bring this up that Henry Ford, his signature, that's what the logo of Ford was based on. There's no curly Q in his signature at all. So there was this guy, Moneybags76, and he did a study to see how many people were affected by the Mandela effect. And he concluded, because of Google searches, that two-thirds of the population were searching for the old way that things used to be. So you're not alone if you're Mandela affected. There's several of us. Um, And now, (laughs) get this though. His own name was changed. It was Mandela affected. Now it's Moneybag seventy three, and he has no recollection of it. And um, you know, even even his audience was like, "You used to be Moneybag seventy six. What, you know, what happened? Now you're Moneybag seventy three, and he doesn't even know that." So I think the people like maybe Sally Fields. You know, now her name's Sally Field, and it's always been Sally Field. Maybe she doesn't know that her name used to be sally fields yeah i don't know i see that's the thing i don't know how it works i, I can't sit explain. here and talk about this all night because i i think it's the most interesting thing that nobody's talking about mm-hmm. you know um you don't see it on the news you don't see it anywhere and you know a, a lot of people that aren't affected by it they just like to shun it off like it's some psyop you're misremembering you don't know what you're talking about you know like we're dumb or something right but no, we pay attention to things. We pay attention to every single little detail. And these people that are, you know, saying this, they're either not affected or they just need some kind of explanation for it that we can't explain.